Okay, um, this is a, uh, if you sense that things are a little more structured than they usually are at J School events, it's because we have the honor of being on C-SPAN. That's what all these cameras and mics are all about. Um, so, uh, to be formal, um, I'm Nick Lemon, the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism. Welcome, everybody. Um, this week is, uh, maybe every week is a little bit this way, but this week is a lot this week. This is our sort of media and te telecommunications policy week here. We have an event tonight. We have another event on Thursday night featuring a speech by uh, FCC Commissioner Mike Copps with a, a number of respondents um, to that. So um, what's, what's all this doing at a journalism school? Um, when I uh, was just starting as dean in the fall of 2003, I was sitting at my desk one day and the phone rang and I picked it up and it was a young woman who was a senior at Harvard and she said, uh, I'm writing a senior thesis on the media reform movement and what I want to know is why is this movement taking place with no journalist ever present at any meeting, convention, conference, et cetera? And um, I said to her, well, that's a good question. Um, I thought that probably wasn't a good thing, although I think I know part of the answer, which is um, for journalists particularly, I, I noticed that, that uh, of the journalists in the audience, they're a little skewed toward broadcast journalism, so you're kind of off this hook. But certainly for print journalists, we like to imagine that we are riding across the prairie on our white horses and practicing journalism, and there is no policy context that matters to us except freedom of the press, maybe. Uh, maybe reporter shield laws. Um, but. I think actually, um, you know, the, the better metaphor would be we're playing on a basketball court or a football field or whatever sports metaphor you want to use. And the way our game unfolds depends on the shape of the field and what the rule book says. And that's where uh, media and communications policy comes in. So um, it's, it's my hope by having these events that, that we both generate some more interest in the school and in the journalistic community in these areas and get journalists into the conversation. And in so doing, we would uh, express uh, sort of the journalistic interest in these issues, which I hope to get to tonight. Uh, the full disclosure here is that in the two books we're going to discuss, there's very little about journalism, but I think implicitly there's a lot about journalism. So one of the tests is how much of that we can bring to the surface. Um, it's a, one of the pleasures of being at Columbia University is um, you get to be colleagues with the people who are essentially creating the discourse on, on a subject rather than just sort of discussing the work of the people creating the discourse. So uh, here we have two books, both published this year. Um, switch them. Uh, Network Nation by Richard John of our faculty and The Master Switch by Tim Wu of the Columbia Law School faculty. Um, they're on a kind of somewhat related subjects, although in, in other ways they're, they're quite different books. Um, and we're hoping that we'll get the two authors to disagree somewhat uh, to make the evening more entertaining. Um, I would say, though, uh, they agree about a few things. If we'll try this out on you and see if you agree that you agree about these things. Um, they agree that uh, neither is a technological determinist. That is, in the general conversation about the internet in particular and telecommunications in general is a sense of poof, the telephone is invented and everything just naturally flows from that. Poof, the internet is invented and everything controls for the, everything flows from that. Both authors in different ways would argue quite forcefully that's only part of the story and it's also when a new mode of communications comes along, 
uh, there starts to be a battle royal involving government policy on the one hand, business interests on the other hand, um, and fights over, to use my earlier metaphor, the shape of the playing field. So they both draw forceful attention to that and say it's really not useful to think of the technology itself in a vacuum, if that's fair. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the rest till, till later. I want to begin by just asking each of them to give a, a very brief kind of, um, the, the kind of thing you're used to from book tour, uh, short description of the book and this main subject and spine of the argument. I'll take them in chronological order. That is, Richard's book was both published first by a few months and is set mostly about 100 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I should also say, uh, th one other thing the books have in common is uh, they share a passionate belief that someone, very few people in the audience have probably ever heard of, uh, Theodore Vail, mm. does that name ring a bell? Was one of the most important nice people one. in American history. Nice um, so you'll get maybe some of that too. So mm. Richard, why don't you start and then we'll go to Tim and then I'll ask you some questions. Good, thank you very much. Um, the book that I wrote, is an attempt to write the history of electrical communications going forward. That is to say, to tell the story beginning in the early republic before we had electrical communications, ending the story with the consolidation of the bell system, which for much of the 20th century, as Tim and I agree, was the centerpiece of American information infrastructure. So I try to tell the story forward rather than backward. And to tell the story, what I try to do is to show how the strategy of the leading players, who were business leaders, almost without exception, their strategy was shaped by the rules of the game or the political economy in which they operated. So structure shaped strategy. In the case of the Telegraph, Samuel Morse emerged in a political economy in which the rules of the game favored government ownership. The post office was a government monopoly. Morse thought the telegraph should be too. Well, it didn't work out that way. It turns out a number of players, including powerful New York editors, were frightened at the prospect of the telegraph destroying the metropolitan press. They used state legislation. They also used their own collective power to establish a new regulatory regime, which I call anti-monopoly. In the anti-monopoly re regulatory regime, the idea was to promote competition among telegraph companies, among network carriers. And that competition persisted for a couple of decades until, lo and behold, the greatest anti-monopolist of them all, Jay Gould, got control of the telegraph network in 1881. He was also the most hated financier of the age. It's hard to think of anyone today who was as hated as Gould. In the telegraph story, then, you have anti-monopoly rules of the game, anti-monopoly political economy, leading to what was effectively a duopoly. There were two companies in the 1880s. And the business strategy that those firms pursued was business-oriented, and it was very narrow. It may come as a surprise that Western Union, which was the main network provider in the Telegraph, never aspired to provide access to ordinary Americans to send information over long distances. If you want to communicate with someone in California, Boston, send a letter. That was the company policy. In the case of the telephone, the story is extremely different. This isn't a matter of the technology, it's a matter of the rules of the game. The telephone business was never unregulated in the way, or lightly regulated in the way the Telegraph was. You needed to get a municipal franchise. And to get a municipal franchise, you were thrown into municipal politics. And in New York and Chicago, that got pretty down and dirty. In order to escape the uh, clutches of the extortionate aldermen, a, gen a second generation of telephone managers decided they were going to try to popularize the medium, which was very bold because it turns out there were a lot of reasons not to expand the telegraph, uh, the telephone network. There were no network externalities of the kind that we today associate with the internet, or very, very few. But the second generation of telephone managers did this. They did it in New York, they did it in Chicago, many other cities, 
The telephone became a social medium around 1900 with the presumption that ordinary people should have access to it. That's a remarkable achievement that was the achievement of Bell Operating Company managers. The story changes once again in the 19 aughts following the collapse of the rivals to this to group of telephone operating companies, which we can call the Bell operating companies, the dominant group, the dominant part because they had control over patents and they had control over resources and so on. There were rivals called the quote unquote independents. They collapsed by 19, 1907, certainly by 1910, and this leads to a change in the uh, political economy with you have the New York State Legislature in 1910, also the Congress declaring telephone common carrier. And this is where Vail becomes important. Vail had little to do with the popularization of the telephone in the city. Tell us who Vail was, because there was, yeah. was a tease on my phone. All right, I'll say who, who was Vail? Vail was the um, a telephone manager who got into the business very early. He was a plunger, he was a speculator, he liked to invest in all sorts of, uh, take flyers and all sorts of new uh, I, technological uh, kind of whiz kid ideas. And he was lured away from a very good job in the railway mail service where he developed this very capacious vision of, of network expansion. His ideas were rooted in the government of the 1870s, the post office being the largest organization in the country and one of the largest in the world. He was lured away to take a flyer on the telephone. And it so happens that the consortium that he ended up with got control of the patents in 1879. There was a struggle involving Jay Gould, and, the, and it was, was at that time attacking Western Union. This is before Jay Gould got control of the telegraph. They then becomes, for a couple of years, manager in New York City, he has to put the wires underground, and very briefly, the president of the then very fledgling speculative venture American Telephone and Telegraph, which was a long distance network uh, provider. It was a very small part of the network and it lost money probably until the 1920s. It was not that uh, important. But he was president of that and more importantly, president of Metropolitan Telephone. He leaves the business for 20 years. He lost money in a venture in Boston, almost went bankrupt. Came back in 1907, a consortium of first generation telephone managers, a new banking group in New York, uh, which J.P. Morgan was important. He came in, and what he tried to do was to create, was to bring to fruition his lifelong dream, which was to bring together the telephone and the telegraph, which if he had the word, he would have called telecommunications. He got his dream fulfilled in 1909 when he bought out Western Union, and for a couple of years, it looked like the telephone company, AT&T, was going to provide universal service, which meant a number of things, including linkage of low-cost, short-distance telephone with low-cost, long-distance telegraph. In other words, it was Vail who helped to popularize the telegraph for the first time. This ran afoul of the uh, Justice Department. And in 1913, the uh, Attorney General McReynolds brokers a, brokers a settlement, forces Vail to give up a, a Western Union. So he's very important in helping to create a kind of public face for Bell. He helps found corporate public relations. He helps associate Bell with technological innovation with long distance, which is a public relations coup for Bell. Not that important commercially, but hugely important in the realm of public relations. Um, but he loses in a number of ways. He doesn't control telegraph. And the, during the First World War, he tries to get control of cable. Doesn't control cable, can't control radio. In some ways, a tragic figure. But the Bell system that he helped to establish <coughs> And, and help to really put on a footing where this, the, the, the stockholders are uh, neutralized, no longer a problem for people like Jay Gould, where the users are relatively happy, and most important of all, where the independents are saved. <laughs> because if the independents had continued to fail and cause problems in the state legislatures as they had between 1907 and about 1913, it might have destabilized the telephone business. So everybody ended up happy. The independents got recognition as they claimed, the leader of the independent, a trade press said, and that was Vail's doing, uh, too. So mm -hmm. the question you were never supposed to ask a historian, yeah. uh, what is the lesson from this that would be <coughs> interesting to help us understand the fights going on over the internet today? Very interesting. Vail's broad vision for telephone, which he articulated, and Tim and I both write about this in some detail, universal service. We have a slightly different ex 
explanation for why it came about. But this was a response to federal legislation. Congress decreed that the telephone and the telegraph will be common carriers, which is a term of art. The New York State Legislature declared that also in 1910. The broad vision for the telephone was a response to that piece of legislation, which made it clear that there was not going to be competition. The telephone business, no, no one wanted competition in the telephone business after uh, really 1907 or certainly <coughs> after 1910, but it was going to be on a stable footing and the investors were going to be neutralized. That is to say, there was going to be no financial jugglery in the telephone business, and that established the telephone network on a sound footing that made it possible for the U.S. Uh, telephone network to be by far the finest in the world in the 20th century, and it helped to create a solid, steady stream of revenue that in Bell Labs, established in 1925, would be directly responsible for some of the most important innovations, including uh, the transistor, uh, which of course is, is the key innovation in the electronic age. So the analogy for journalism, the takeaway for today was, I think, the money that made possible Bell Labs came from ordinary telephone users, big cities, they didn't have any interest really in supporting Bell Labs, but they got reasonably good telephone service, local, because that's all they wanted for the most part, uh, and then that money went to Bell Labs, and Bell Labs then acted as a de facto national laboratory. Cross subsidies were so important to the telephone business, and it was only possible because of the extremely complicated regulatory regime in which it operated. No, no different regulatory regime in telegraph, anti-monopoly, not cross subsidies, you didn't have the great public benefit. Uh, that's a perfect <laughs> cue to throw to Tim, who I think will vigorously disagree with some of that. Right. Although maybe not all. Um, I just wish to get to the local news angle. I, I just want to point out that the title of this book is a quote from Fred Friendly uh, from his days as a Columbia J School professor. Yeah. Um, and uh, Fred's widow Ruth is here tonight, so welcome. Um, and Tim, uh, over to you. Sure, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for welcoming a relative outsider to the world of writing and journalism. And um, <clears throat> back when I, uh, back in the 1990s, I, I worked in um, Silicon Valley in the, the dot-com industry. And uh, there was one thing that we were absolutely certain about, absolutely certain beyond any other question, that we were living in times without precedent. Anyone can start a website. Fortunes were being made under, overnight. The internet was radical, was different. There had nothing been like it before in human history, and there would never be anything like it again. As I got into academia, I started to wonder whether, in fact, that was true. 100 years ago, graduates of Columbia University as opposed to being interested in, in a startup or, or an app company, which is sort of a popular career choice today, might have thought about starting a telephone company. In the 1920s, you might have started thinking about starting a radio station. It turns out that all of these media were at one point open, competitive, entrepreneurial industries. It turns out that we've lived the internet revolution, that moment, that, that kind of environment where things are open, competitive, entrepreneurial, everything seems to be different, that we have been there before. And so what I was interested in when I wrote this book, and the reason I wrote this book, is I wanted to see what had happened to the other darling, exciting new media of the 20th century. I had wanted to see whether, by seeing what had happened to the enthusiasm and utopia of early radio, the excitement and, uh, comp and competition surrounding farmers who were, were setting up their own phone networks in, in the West. What had happened to those eras? And what my book is about is about the fate of essentially these moments of openness, that there, I suggest, is a long cycle in the information industries between a more open, competitive entrepreneurial phase and a more closed, integrated, higher quality and often monopolistic phase, dominated either by one company, AT&T being the best example, NBC being another and CBS in their time, 
the third great example, or, or dominated by a cartel, Hollywood being the greatest example. Film, a competitive industry eventually run by a, a cartel. So I wanted to know, and then finally, ask in our times, is the internet destined for the same future? In other words, the sort of openness and entrepreneurial that we took for granted working in Silicon Valley, that we assumed was forever, now that we've had the revolution. Whether it too is destined for the same fate of every other new medium, and whether we have a choice or not, whether we can change and maintain a, a more open, if that medium, if that's what we want, if we like things the way they are. So, there's a lot to, to talk about here. I want to, um, I guess, cut to the chase to some extent. By the way, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to start taking questions from the audience, which must be given from this mic, so be thinking. Um, again, I'm, I'm, tr I'm, I'm sort of canting this a little toward journalism, although not completely. Um, you both agree that uh, when this process that you're talking about, Tim, happens, um, the, the bad news <coughs> from a public interest standpoint is, is much less diversity of, of, I guess you'd call opinion or speech or content. Yeah. Uh, because there, there is a sort of small group of established players. But the upside is some, you know, higher level of quality, maybe of service, and of, of content. There, there's a very brief uh, section uh, in, the, in your book where you, you know, make reference to the uh, so-called golden age of television. Right. Um, and, and uh, you know, Bell Labs and that, that, that we tend to be nostalgic for these oligopolies and monopolies because they can use their stable position or do sometimes to create public goods that are very, very expensive and that can't be created in an di open distributed system. So, you know, for us in the news business, the big question is if you move the master switch to openness, Right. Do you lose the ability for anybody to produce high quality content? Um, so I'm curious for your thoughts on that. So you're, you're get, get right. I, I'll, I'll start by uh, avoiding the question for a minute and say that <laughs> <laughs> it is the hard question, but I'll start by avoiding it for a minute to say that even though I've agreed to take the side of open, I, in, in truth, if you read the book, it reveals a, a kind of profound uh, ambiguity with monopoly. I, I both sort of worship it like a lot of people do, <laughs> in the way that people all very openly worship monopoly, and, and, the, and men like Vale would say, this is just the best, it's the biggest, the greatest. Uh, there are these golden ages that are undeniable. You, you know, you have, and, and the benefits, and, and journalism is one of them, these sort of, the birth of journalism has a lot to do with an industrial structure that can support the kind of quality journalism that the world never saw before the 20th century. So I have a profound, the, the truth is I, I feel profoundly ambiguous, but the, to me the drawbacks overweigh the advantages in the long term. Um, the problem with monopoly over the long term is while it starts promising and, and, and results in a golden, often as it results in a golden age, over the long term, entrenchment leads to paranoia, stagnancy, and abuse over the long term. You know, CBS and NBC, when they started, had a lot to say for them. By the 1970s, things had gone too far. <laughs> and so what I guess I, I, I suggest in my book, a, a more modified version of my position is, it is important to have the institute, the, the sort of structures that can support quality things, but the, not at the cost of entrenching mm -hmm. a monopolist for so long that they just lose any sight of what they have to do. And I think that's what happened with many of the media organizations in this country by around the 60s and 70s. Well, I guess two follow-up questions to that. One is a sort of prescriptive and one is descriptive. I'll do the descriptive one first. You do a wonderful job in the book of describing this sort of tragic process you just described briefly where a new communications medium comes along, all things are possible, there are these wonderful dreams of how fabulous it's going to be. This, the title comes from the now long forgotten period when there were such dreams about cable television. Some of you may remember those days. Um, 
and then inevitably the bad guys take over and get their hand on the master switch. Yeah. How can that not happen again if it happens every time? Right, right. What journalists need to understand uh -huh. is uh, the importance of creative destruction in the journalism industries. It's very, tech people are always like, oh, we have to have a dynamic industry. We, we want to see companies die and be destroyed. Journalists are uh, certain afraid of death. <laughs> they, they have a poor relationship with... That's with so no, the journalists, have, <laughs> journalists and media people have a very poor... I mean, look at these brands. New York Times has been going for... That's unheard of in other industries that have any sort of uh, turmoil or, or natural market process. Mm -hmm. To have brands that last for hundreds and hundreds of years and have these dominant positions. Uh, journalists are... Exactly. Two, they, 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 what, is needed in journal, what is needed in journalism is a, a, a dynamism, a little bit of creative destruction. And it's not comfortable, and journalists will be upset about it, but in the long run, it will be good for you. Right, but, but I, I wanna, <laughs> you're switching from descriptive to prescriptive. Right. Let's switch back yeah. to descriptive for a minute. The, okay. the, the model, I think Richard would say this based on my reading of his book, is Tim, you're dreaming because, you know, any communications medium as, as powerful as the internet just cannot, you, the you know, liberal reformer public interest advocates just cannot ever build a big enough fence around it to keep the process that's always happened in the past from happening again. So just as a practical matter, how do you think we can prevent this process that right. you've convinced us is cyclical from happening in this instance. Right, sure. This is, uh, the answer is, is related to my, some of my other work on things like net neutrality, which is to say there always needs to be channels, whether it's the internet or other channels, where the new can challenge the old. Right. Where the New York Times gets a run for its money, where NBC is suddenly facing off against YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. There has to be these channels, and the problem with, and the problem, I'll just go on the offensive and say the problem with the kind of worship of managerial capitalism in your book, is it's too <laughs> insensitive to the fact that managerial capitalism tends to make market entry very difficult, to, to put it that way. Well, the problem with your argument, Tim, <laughs> is that there's no getting around the inevitability of the cycle. If I read your book, I would come away very depressed because every single case you tell is one in which you have these bold innovators with these great ideas who are stomped down upon by these sort of either money mad or reactionary plutocrats and then something happens and this wonderful idea is born in someone gar someone's garage and someone's attic and it starts up again and that just isn't so there were major public policy triumphs bell loses big time in the 19-teens. They don't get to control the telegraph as well as the telephone, the, the kind of separations principle that you write about so, uh, so I think persuasively and movingly in your final section, happened there, Radio Act of 1927, keeps AT&T out of the content business, content, conduit, are divided there. If you had not had the studio system in Hollywood, we, which you have the, the coming together of the people making the movies, and the ownership of the theaters. The United States might never have established a, a dominant position in the world film business. Yeah, that we did in the 1930s and 40s. The British, right. we have 80% of the world market. The Europeans couldn't get their act together. We did, and that made possible the creativity that led to the self-sustained uh, development of Hollywood. If you didn't have the Hollywood studio system, you also wouldn't have had the most, most heinous example of private censorship in American history. Uh, private that, censorship, which is a which ridiculous is claim, Tim. <laughs> well, first, the most heinous example of censorship. Private censorship. Wait, well, what is the most which heinous I, which example? Which I'm going to. But let me, let me explain. Let's tell the story. Okay, so tell you why you're wrong. because thanks to the. <laughs> Thanks to the consolidation of the industry into the Hollywood studio system, a, car, a tartel of five uh, vertically integrated studios, or maybe it's six, um, every, uh, the, the Catholic Church was finally able to enforce the production code mm -hmm. and set up a system, which you're familiar with, and sure. many people in our audience are, where one man, Joseph Breen, had to okay every single film before it was made, which is, in First Amendment terms, called a prior restraint and would be okay. so illegal if it was a government system. But we had the system, and let me give you one example. Warner Brothers in their mid-30s wanted to make a movie 
wanted to make a movie about what the Nazis were doing in Germany. They were like, listen, this is bad. <laughs> you know, bad things are coming. I want to make Joseph Breen, who described his job as shoving ethics down the throats of the Jews. That was how he described his job. I'm here to shove ethics down the throats of the group, Jews. Veto the movie. It was never made. I, mean, I don't know what it would have prepared anything, but this is a form of censorship that should be intolerable to anyone in the journalism school. But Except that one man decides what American Jim, film is. Jim, it isn't one man. This is the problem with the whole book, that these heroic individuals who arise out of nowhere, the mo mobile makes the medium. market medium. Look, the reason Breen did what he did was because seven states were poised to enact codes of their own. And those states then could have created a patchwork of restrictions on movies. And goodness knows what the consequences would have been. The studios worked with Breen because it was an alternative to government censorship at the state level level. And, and that would have been reminiscent of the censorship at the state level over all sorts of matters that persisted right up until New York Times. So let me, let me jump in on another point. Um, back to my, my, this is a question to you, Tim, back to the, the issue about um, uh, the trade-off between openness, avoiding things like the Joseph Green scenario, and not having a, a sort of protective mechanism to uh, uh, produce certain kinds of content that, that requires a lot of economic, regulatory, whatever protection to produce, institutional protection. I mean, an example that springs to my mind, although I don't think this will be that persuasive to you, is your own field of legal scholarship. Oh, yes. Which, you know, if it sits inside this huge structure of bar exams and legal licensing and tenure and Am I supposed to defend universe? the legal profession? No, but, but if you felt legal right. scholarship were precious, and if you de-oligopolized the legal profession, arguably there would be no legal scholarship produced, because there just wouldn't be the, the means to produce it. Is that a price worth paying, or is there some sort of backdoor way of, of, of getting, you know, we're particularly interested in journalism, the reporting done and, and all that in, in a world that, that really privileges diversity of opinion and diversity of power. So the question is, is whether we should always accept you know, artificial barriers on the, essentially on the market or on, on, uh, in order to preserve things that we, we admire. Um, I'd say so, but I say we overdo it a lot. The legal profession is a great example. Uh, it's not as bad as in other countries, you know, the American legal profession, but I mean, a lot of people could do legal work that were not lawyers. Um, in but fact, lawyers do things you don't need legal training to do without their lives. But yeah. You're not saying the, the sort of two clicks to the left of you position that the crowd will provide anything that has real value, right? Yeah, if you wanted me to say that, you'd have to find somebody. So well, we'll you should have invited Clay Shirky. Shirky. You're coming here two days oh, yeah. you, can so find, you, can, you can find Clay Shirky or, or another <laughs> people. I'm not a, uh, no, I think there, there are differences in what is produced. Um, let me ask you. I'm, I'm, I, I guess my problem with journalists is that they, or the journalistic uh, way of thinking about things, is they, any industry, once it has its, its tariff, essentially, its protection, begins to fetishize or treasure it mm -hmm. and begin to give it an importance, which really is a barrier to trade. So, you know, the, the legal profession is great. They, they say all this great stuff about the bar exam and they, they well, especially in other countries. And it really is just, uh, and, and so that, that's the danger. And journalism is always insulating itself against change, mm -hmm. continually, and then calling it something nice, like the newsroom, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and, and they, and, and give great speeches about it. Uh, you know, I love Steve Cole, but he'll always give a speech of, Sort of He's going to be here about how great the, uh, the newsroom is and everything. But, but Tim, there yeah. are organizational capabilities that are built up over a period of time in organizations, large and small, that if they are dissipated, are hard to put back together again. It is possible for a country, for example, to lose its edge in X, Y, or Z technology. It goes overseas, you're not going to get it back. You can't, the miracle of the marketplace isn't going to solve all your problems. Right. And the story I tell about telephone is not about veil. It's about the guys at the middle level, unsung heroes who you don't write about, who made the key changes. But those organizations were pretty large too. 
And that's what worries me about the current internet because the advertising revenue for newspapers, as we know, print media, which has generated the vast majority of the news stories that we rely on to keep government and business accountable, right? That, as we know, has largely vanished. And what are we gonna do about it as a nation? And if we do not, if we do not recognize that organizations can do things that individuals sitting in their attics or garages can't and have not done. If we don't realize that, then it seems to me that we are not being realistic about the possibilities as well as the limitations of organization as a way of, of, of shaping right. uh, content. You know, I, I haven't denied, and I said before, I have a profoundly ambiguous relationship with, with large organizations. But and the, you're much the higher point. on Bale than I am. What's that? You're much higher on Bale than I am. <laughs> yeah, he's a looks like Theodore Roosevelt. He says crazy things. I, I kind he's of, a megalomaniac. <laughs> that's attractive in its way. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it interesting to write about. Um, but I, 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 I will not deny that there are that there are certain efficiencies gained by large institutions. But the problem. I see it as a dynamic or in some way secular process. That is to say, an institution, let's say Google right now, is in its kind of a golden age. It's full of smart people. They're, they, they, they have uh, swimming pools and uh, volleyball courts. It's, you know, it's in this moment where they're like, this is really special. In, in, undoubtedly, within five or 10 years, they will turn their interest in innovation into an interest in, in trying to stay in power. They're, try, they're trying to make sure this doesn't happen, but every organization begins to decay and become rotten. And so while I'll agree with you, there are advantages to these gigantic institutions, but we haven't figured out a way to get rid of them when they start to rot. We need, essentially, term limits for monopolists. We understand this in politics. We're like, no matter who the president is, after eight years, he's going to be crazy. He's going to be trying to, I mean, if you let him go forever, he's going to try and, and set up his own kingdom, become the king. And my belief is not that monopolists are, are terrible, it's just that they stay around too long. AT&T uh, you know, was in power for 70 years. By the 50s, had already lost it, uh, in, my, in my opinion. I mean, they had some advantage, but that, well, we can disagree about that. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me yeah. switch, because uh, I want to get to audience questions. Sure. I want to ask one question a little bit off point, but it, it's somewhat <coughs> interesting and relevant. Probably the most nakedly journalistic part of both of your books is a discussion of the relationship between Western Union and the Associated Press. So I wonder if one or both of you could <coughs> fill us in on that. Yeah, yeah um, uh, in which, any, any, just the whole story? Yeah, yeah in brief. Because yeah. it's, 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 I'll tell you why I think it's relevant to yeah. today. I, I think uh, the Western Union Associated Press example, it's, it's quite complicated, and your book is actually much deeper on it than mine is. Mine it pulls out the lurid details. Uh, essentially, but you you have a uh, there are plenty. Yes, you ha that is the danger of unrestrained monopoly power. To Wait, let's influence. first to yeah. describe okay. the basic Sorry. situation. Yeah, Western Union was essentially the monopoly provider of telegraph carriage, and they had a relationship with the then new Associated Press as uh, and they, they, was, they were sort of the exclusive carrier for the Associated Press. The Associated Press was the exclusive content provider uh, to Western Union. And there was a quid pro quo here that was explicit right. in the 1860s. That Western Union managers were terrified, as we now know, because I've worked in the, the letter books, the internal corporate archives, which have just opened up uh, in the late 1990s. They were terrified of either being taken over by the government, which was very plausible, or being, in effect, subject to hostile legislation. And they recognized that if the press began to editorialize, <laughs> calling for regulation or ownership, they'd be in trouble. So they cut a deal. We'll give you low rates. You won't say nasty things about us. And uh, that held for about 20 years. It seems to me Google is in a position to strike the same deal. That would be a violation of neutrality, by the way. This yeah, is actually this a big is, lesson about net neutrality. Yeah, exactly. yeah, so this is the problem of the special deal. Uh, the telegram, uh, just to repeat this, in, in the 1860s was really the only method of instant long distance communications. Yeah. So, that, so anyone who had uh, control of this in terms of a news service had an immediate advantage because mm -hmm. their news would arrive instantly. And that is a tremendous power, which would have been fine if it were used sort of for good. And maybe sometimes it was, but they also had the habit of wanting to throw elections yeah. or try to influence or elections, try. keep the republic. The, the other yeah. detail that isn't obvious here is that before 1945, 
the press associations, the news brokers, uh, did not have to give the news equally to everyone. So the New York Associated Press cut deals with certain newspapers and not with others. And needless to say, it was those newspapers they didn't cut deals with that began to lobby against them. Yeah. So, so just the last thing before we go to questions, just to show you why all this matters, one could argue on Richard's side, I don't know if you would, that, that these kind of incredibly unfair relationships helped establish the Associated Press, which is still one of the great news organizations of the world. On the other hand, all other news organizations cried foul, <coughs> rightly so, about the special deal the Associated Press has. Mm -hmm. Why does this matter today? This has been happening and will continue to happen. The chair of the FCC, another former student of Fred Friendly's, Julius Janitowski, is going to announce a net neutrality initiative tomorrow, supposedly. It'll be instantly opposed by the industry. The scenario would be something like, you know, people who carry the wires into your house that gives you access to the internet might strike deals with preferred journalistic and other providers that say with this deal you can get faster better instantaneous service and we can help support these news organizations but there's a downside so just just to note this is not irrelevant history it, it's it's really queued yeah. up right now it's the it's the um, strongest example of the dangers of total deregulated monopoly of information is that not only does it you know it mean that you have one new, you know does it mean that you don't have diversity? It means that you'll have an influence on the political system. That there's a very powerful ability to try and move. It's a threat to democracy. Is see, what it shows. I, I yeah. see it very differently. I think you can make a good case that AT and T and Apple are schumpeterian innovators, that they're doing exactly what your cycle would predict. They're creating all kinds of new content and that that may bring with it benefits. And why should Netflix be able to send, you know, use 20% of the internet to send movies? I think you could make an argument that, um, and I'm not taking a policy stance here, but reading your book, mm. you could contend that in fact, you should be arguing against net neutrality. You should be arguing for Apple and against Google. I think I would burst into flames if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's go to audience questions. And I, I hate to make you all schlep to the microphone, but we, this is uh, on C-SPAN and everything. So um, who wants to start that process? There we go. Um, you mentioned that uh, in the early part of the 20th century, they, they had to separate these industries in order for them to, to flourish. So do you see the same kind of separation which Tim advocates in the internet industry? Yeah, I think it is important to recognize that in the United States, we have a long-standing tradition going back to the founders of limiting concentrated <coughs> power. Uh, newspapers were permitted into the mails in the 1790s on a non-preferential basis, which is enormously important for the structure of the press. The telegraph, was not taken over by the post office. The telephone was not taken over by the telegraph, and so on. This is different from the pattern European countries. And this didn't happen because there were clever guys and addicts coming up with great ideas. This happened because of public policy, anti-monopoly of public policy. And I think that your suggestion about a distinction between content and conduit that should be constitutionalized is, I think, a very provocative one, worth considering. I would contend there's a much stronger historical grounding for right. that than even you provide in yeah, your book. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. I, I'll take that. Let me just yeah, ask sorry. you, for those who haven't read the book, to just state, yeah. you call it the separation principle. Right. Just tell, tell us what it All is. All right, so the, from studying the, the history of these areas, I decided, I, it occurred to me the worst problems always came when you had a unity of ownership over moving information and creating information. When the pipe, people own the pipes essentially became the same people who created content because there's always an inherent conflict of interest in those situations. Uh, the Western Union uh, Associated Press example is this probably the strongest. Mm -hmm. And so I, I said- be The yeah. example that you give in your book is right. this was the dream behind the Time AOL merger. You know, mm -hmm. you'd live in New York City, Time brought the wire into your house. You then could only get to the internet through AOL, and then you could only get to timing content. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of right. dream of a closed system that got blown apart by the uh, 
internet protocol. Yeah, that's right. That, that is something we write about. And, and I agree with what you said. Uh, traditionally, the separations principle I talked about was an industry by industry principle. That is, one company has a telegraph, another company runs telephone, another set of companies run radio, another set of companies run film. Film had a while, they were interested in getting in TV, the FCC said no. So there was this policing. Mm -hmm. But the structure of today's, what we need to do is reinvent that principle mm -hmm. for today's technologies. And to, to cut industries vertically like that doesn't make any sense anymore. My separations principle is a horizontal cut, if, if that makes sense. I, I, the content I, I, company yeah. is separated from the carriage company. Right, and right. so on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, in talking about some of these uh, new media that came along and gave us these great you know, golden age, like freedom reign kinds of things that then the big corpocracy took over and sort of killed, um, a lot of these businesses were very capital intensive. There were economies of scale that would encourage bigness and squeeze out the little operator. And I'm just wondering if the internet finally has taken us to another level where right. The barriers to entry are very low. There, right. Is anybody in here blogging right now in this event? Live as we're here, are we on the internet? I think we ban laptops. Like all right, that. okay. Sorry. But in, in, in places like this all over the country, right. like, there are people blogging and uh, describing this stuff, yeah. what they're doing. And maybe this time the corpocracy won't be able to kind of take right. over and hijack this thing, and people will be able to, to use the internet. And by the way, all these other costs, too. You can have a radio station with right. a website. You can make movies now with little cheap cameras that right. look pretty good. Um, you know, maybe finally the cartels won't run things. A uh, fabulous question, and in some ways that is the big question at the center of this book. You know, is, is the history destiny, or is it, can, can in some ways uh, are things be different? My point would be not assume things are going to be different, because some things have changed and some things haven't. Some of the things that have changed are that the internet itself is fundamentally designed differently than the old communications networks. The, the protocols of the center are open. They're not owned by anybody, very different. Investment is different. Investment structures are different. Uh, challengers to the monopolist can get funding from the venture capital industry, and that, that uh, as, as you write about, often credit was used to starve challengers. And I don't think we also just socially have the same worship of size. You know, people aren't, I think in, the, in, in certain periods of American history, bigger and progress were the same idea. And maybe you'll disagree with that. So there's, there's certain things that have definitely changed, and I'm, I'm sensitive to this, but there's certain things that haven't changed. Economics, the basic principles of economies of scale, network effects, uh, uh, natural monopoly, have not clearly changed. And most importantly, human nature. We have not changed, we're the same. Consumers still love convenience almost over anything. Who here does not use Google? <laughs> I went to Microsoft, but half people put up their hands, by the way. But <laughs> only half of But you know, like, we still love convenience. We still love the, the sort of benefits of the, the, the ease of a single company providing something as opposed to trying to figure out one or another. We still love that, and there are still people who want to run empires and who have an interest in consolidating industries, and that hasn't changed. But there are differences between what's going on today, and, and we agree about this, and what went on 100 years ago. Bell had a public service mandate, which was mandated by the states and the federal government. And, and Google today has a mandate, do no evil, which is basically backed by the three guys who own Google. And it, it seems to me that, the high, large percent of the share, it seems to me that that's a real problem. Because we're not in a thousand, let a thousand flowers bloom mode right now. We're in a mode in which very large entities are moving as Schumpeter would want them to, to carve up the, uh, the, the information uh, infrastructure. And they're doing it pretty fast, and they're doing it in a world in which we have powerful voices that say, the market reigns, the little guy is blocking, the little gal is blocking. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that's fantasy. Right. Wait, next question. The, uh, I'm going to try and melt both threads of this. Um, the telecommunications uh, giant AT&T, um, as you said, uh, provide research and such under a regime of a regulated monopoly, right. and a regulated rate of return. Mm -hmm. They broke up Ma Bell, mm -hmm. right? It is now reconsolidated, it, so now basically AT&T and Verizon constitute most of what were the seven baby belts. Correct. So now we have the worst of both worlds. Correct. We have a 
deregulated do a, a monopoly, essentially, because they don't compete out of region except they're more outlets. To bring it to the journalism point of view, I would say that this story is vastly undercovered, that this sort of consolidation between uh, uh, um, that public infrastructure is being held hostage by people who, who now, Verizon and AT&T, both Correct. claim to want deregulation, right? That regulation is an evil, because they, they, but they were built, they have these inherent advantages, as do, as do a lot of the cable MSOs. So my question right. is why do you see that as coincidental that, that it's an undercover story in journalism? No, I don't see it coincidental at all. I don't see it coincidental that Google gets, as I read the papers, such good press, or that net neutrality gets such good press because those two interests are aligned. But net neutrality is the government trying to tell people to be better. Yeah, but net neutrality is common carriage, which is the, re the public pressure you were talking with about. With common carriage, they're going to be winners and losers. Yeah. Right. But and that's what you were asking for, so I don't understand why you're... No, what, I'm, what I'm asking for is a recognition that the telecoms and other big players, including Google, have an obligation to serve the public rather than their shareholders or themselves or their own vision yeah, of I the agree. future. Yeah, no, so right. That's what I'm asking. I want to. There's several there? other questions. We're getting near the end, yeah. so I want to move things along to the next uh, next question. Oh, this is a two-part question. Um, one, in terms of the overarching arguments of the respective texts, um, how did you compensate for, or how do you see? the switch between, say, a telephone or a telegraph, wherein one person is sending to one other person, and then the sort of at least much valued uh, prospect of one person communicating to many and being a content provider as a, quote, you know, previous user on the internet. And then two, what I see potentially is a feedback loop if there is a tiered internet of people who are, I suppose, most privileged in society, not only having um, recourse to traditional educational and financial benefits, but also to higher tiers, bandwidth, access to further information, and how that loop then intersects with potentialities. What, what's the feedback loop? Maybe I didn't, didn't oh, quite understand. So that, you know, if you're a person of right. means, you not only have educational and financial advantages, you would, in a tiered internet, right. also have access to greater bandwidth, and then in turn, more information and more access to a potential audience as a user slash content producer. I see. Well, let me, let me talk about the first. Um, I, point, one to many, I, you know, one of the promises of the internet is that it, uh, it is a medium where anyone's a publisher, you know, anyone can be, this is what everyone is excited about. But I, I, one thing I'll just suggest that isn't completely unheard of before, early radio had some of those features as well, early film in some ways, uh, it was when there was a lot of producers. Now, it still wasn't as easy as it was with, the, with, the, with blogging, but um, that we have seen, seen some of that before. And the question, I, I think well, one interesting thing is whether we will look back at this period 10 years from now and say, remember that sort of when user-generated content was in and remix culture? That was a, there's this fundamental question as to whether that's just kind of a fad or something we're going through right now or whether that is a fundamental shift. And I, I don't know the answer. Steve Jobs thinks it's not. Steve Jobs says, there's one thing we know about Americans, they don't want amateur hour. They want Hollywood content. And so there are a lot of people who, th even though we think things have changed forever, again, it's back to my theme, uh, want to make things the way they were. Let me just give two quick observations about that. The yeah. One is, so the fascinating conclusions of my telephone research was that a lot of Americans were willing to pay for low quality telephone if it was cheaper. And I think that that's relevant to the current debate over net neutrality. Not everybody, uh, and, and in fact, the folks we're insisting on flat rate or same quality service for everyone. Those were the big business users, and they were using power to the people as an argument in order to, in effect, protect their turf. And I think that that's worth keeping in mind. Second, this idea that decentralized media is prima facie democratic. Early radio, and you say this in your book, had, right. it, it lost a lot of its potential. Well, if we hadn't had Edward R. Murrow in the Second World War, hear it now, if we'd had a lot of little radio stations, Bring no, one, really. no one with the resources in London to be broadcasting about the Nazis, uh, you know, we would may perhaps be in a different place today. And I think that that is a real problem with this debate over small is beautiful. There's a reason you have journalistic professionals. There's a reason you have standards. There's a reason you have training. And there's a reason that you have a limitation on 
access from the point of view of an ordinary human being. You, 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 not everybody is sitting there surfing the net 10 hours a day. And we now know we have survey data of what college students are doing. They're doing a lot less on the internet than you'd think. And the bloggers tend to come from a rather, uh, you know, well off part of the, of right. the socials. Let me okay. say, uh, since it's eight and we can only go right. two more minutes, I see three questioners, right? So um, you're the last three questions. So we'll do your three questions and then call it a night. So. Thank you. Um, perhaps um, I can ask a question to perhaps link the two, two sides, because I don't think that's actually that antagonistic. But that's no fun, it's more. <laughs> well, we both write about the telephone, and we both think the telephone is really important. Well, one of the strikes me is that if I was in Europe, if I was in Asia, and I was listening to a debate like this, yeah. it would be strange because it would be two people talking about mainly American uh, business uh, in innovations and cycles. Yeah. So perhaps the question that I would like to pose is <clears throat> this amazing ability of the American economy, at least in the 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, to produce and dominate these these successive waves of of media content, software, hardware, or whatever term you want to use, is perhaps related to the cycle of open and close. If by close we mean the time when uh, some folks can make some real money, and that profit motive of the prior or the current cycle drives the desire to be the next Facebook or to be the next Facebook Square, you know, whatever it is, you know, right. if yeah. Right, I got it. Yeah, I want to answer that too. Do you want to say something? Tim, you go yours. Oh, we're going to answer this. Yeah. Um, it basically, you restated the idea of Joseph Schumpeter's. That, that Joseph Schumpeter's theory of capitalism. That the lure of monopoly profit is what is the, the real driving force of American capitalism or any capitalism system, not this Adam <coughs> Smith idea of people competing. That's really just going for it. Um, this book is situated, and maybe it is something unusual about America. Uh, I'm Canadian, so I, I you can't accuse me of being that parochial. It's just all this stuff was invented here, and the industries, and they still tend to dominate. And it, it's, a, it's fascinating, and there's a mystery as to why, and maybe you But got I don't think it's as big a mystery as you do. It has a lot to do with the political order. It has a lot to do with the political economy. We have extraordinarily strong protections for intellectual property. That's why Bell got into the telephone business, he thought, or his future father-in-law thought he could make a killing. Right. And, th and that was the same story with radio. And why radio in the United States rather than Britain in the First World War? The Navy said, we're going to buy up all of the British patents. We are going to establish dominance in radio because we don't have dominance in cable. So political economy has been unusually favorable to entrepreneurship because you've got strong intellectual property rights and you've got an anti-monopoly tradition or separations tradition that tries to promote competition. And those two things working together is a real engine of innovation. And Schumpeter was writing about industries, electrical, where patent rights were absolutely central. And it seems to me that that's what holds us together. Schumpeter did not recognize the extent to which the distinctive political economy of the United States was responsible for its extraordinary record of innovation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding the inevitable, inevitable nature that you said of monopolies um, to move towards corruption and once you know their power, their foothold on, on the technology and society, um, the way society runs, uh, starts to falter. So, specifically regarding that, where at what stage do you think Facebook and Google are at in, in these uh, internet monopolies? I'm also <coughs> commenting on uh, your recent yeah. Wall Street Journal article. Um, and how do you think their motivations to stay on top in the future will affect their right. activities overseas? It's a great question. Uh, I guess we could ask the European Union about Google. We yeah. started the antitrust investigation today. I was at Google this morning, actually, uh, in, in DC. And we were talking about this exact question. And G G Google says, we, Google's idea is that they have designed their company to try to avoid internal corruption. That, that was what they said. Now, we were at their company, so of course they're saying this. But they say, we feel we're extremely aware of this danger. And we are, we put in measures to try to prevent ourselves from becoming corrupted. Just external uh, corruption. In three guys own right. what? 30, 40% yeah, of the Yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just saying, this is what they, that, they, they that feel. Sure this, is, this, is, went to too, right? this is what they think. They, they are trying, they believe that this would, is, would be the, their downfall. So, um, 
they're trying. Now, what, where do I think? I think we are in a kind of golden age. I mean, the, there's a lot of amazing stuff going on right now. Uh, watch very carefully a certain ratio of, of innovation versus self-preservation measures. You can look at any industry and see what ratio between the two you see. Journalism is like, or for, <laughs> for a long time, journalism was like all preservation, no innovation, sort of the shift a little bit. Um, the content industries, Hollywood, say 80% of their effort is to try to can defend their business model, 20% to try and improve it. Uh, and, and I think that th that is the moment. You watch that ratio when it starts to tip. And when they start to get abusive, you know, when they start to exclude or destroy their rivals. And that's the moment where I think the law, I mean, I, I'm like, that's the moment antitrust needs to come in. Yeah. Uh, so, last question. Before um, you made the comment or insinuated that uh, people in the reporting world nowadays mm -hmm. look down on things because of the situation in terms of newspapers and the media business, etc. And I was curious, couldn't you say that we may be now in a trough, but things are going to go up? In other words, and we've had them before, in other words, you had newspapers, they worried about television and movies, you know, <coughs> causing problems, but then television created more jobs for journalists, and right. couldn't we have the same thing happen now, in other words, you have uh, uh, new internet companies starting up uh, by press people themselves, who are not only you know writing, but now they're owning their little uh, niche-oriented newspapers, so that in the long right. term, there will be more jur jobs for people in the journalism world rather than less. Uh, there's an argument which I don't necessarily endorse, which says that journalists are like farmers. In other words, they're always complaining. There's something always wrong, you know. There's a, and you go back to there's always something wrong. There's some threat. <laughs> You know, the weather, they're all, always about to be wiped out, and then, you know, but the, but the underlying function is important, so it survives. I don't know, I don't know if I endorse that view, because I do think there are, I do think 19th century journalism is quite a bit different. And so journalism always, I mean, whatever you want to call journalism, uh, news is interesting to humans. And so gathering things that people have never heard of before to tell them, or, or things they don't know, will always be a function that people will pay something for or want. Uh, that function will always survive, whether objective journalism can survive, whether newsrooms, uh, uh, truthful journalism can survive, that's a very different question. And it's a question that, that in our history has not been solved by the miracle of the marketplace. It's been solved by all kinds of monopolies and all kinds of subsidies that are quite artful, that have made possible the remarkable uh, tradition of, of journalistic excellence. I think that's important to keep on the table. I think that's one of the issues that will be addressed on Thursday, because that was a central issue in Steve McCall's recent uh, uh, Columbia Journalism Review piece. Yeah. Okay, so that's a that's a good place to end. You want to make one more point, Tim? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I hope that you leave this event uh, stimulated persuaded that all these kinds of uh, regulatory uh, issues really matter to the future of journalism, and that you feel this so strongly that you'll come back to this very room two nights from now to hear more of the same from Commissioner Cox. If you come, Tim, you will hear him specifically praise your book in his speech. Uh, so this should be I'm not, I'm not, I'm unfortunately, right. back to the homeland. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks a lot to both of you. I uh, urge everybody to read these books and, and stay up on all this stuff. Thanks. I think they're for sale. Also. Yeah, they're for sale.